without further ado, I'm going to get things started. We have an outstanding guest today, uh, Dr. Gina Jefferson. She is a professor of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery. She's at the University of Mississippi in, um, in, in, in sorry, I was going to stop Biloxi. In, <laughs> what is the capital of Mississippi? Jackson, Mississippi. Jackson, Jackson Mississippi. Uh, she specializes in head and neck uh, microvascular surgery. Um, and uh, she's a friend of the society. And as many of you know, she is very much involved in um, National Society of the American Head and Neck uh, Society. Uh, she also just mentioned briefly, oh, my dog just came in, uh, the Society of University Otolaryngologists, um, as well as the American College of Surgeons, and of course, the Harry Barnes Society. And so I thought it would be good to have an update on thyroid cancer. There's a lot uh, there's a lot of new things on the horizon, and uh, Dr. Jefferson has uh, real expertise in all head and neck oncology, so she uh, graciously agreed to, to give us this talk, and I'm going to uh, let her take it away. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Dr. Johnson, for that introduction, and thank you all for um, coming to hear this presentation. Um, I'm sorry I was unable to make it to the Academy meeting to uh, interact with all of you. I miss you. And um, unfortunately, I'm presenting by virtual means. Um, let me see here. Share screen. Can you all see my screen? I take that as a yes. Yes, we can. Awesome. So um, I'm going to discuss, as Dr. Johnson indicated, um, an update kind of of differentiated thyroid cancers. Um, I do have one financial disclosure. I'm a consultant for Cook Medical. It should have no impact or bearing on the topic of this presentation. And this presentation, I would like to cover um, a review of the background and the statistics of thyroid cancer, kind of highlighting some of the risk factors and discuss staging. As you know, um, there was an update for the AJCC staging system um, back in 2017 um, to review uh, the nodule workup for a thyroid gland, um, discuss surgical intervention, and what do we do in the event of thyroid cancer recurrence? Um, so, as you all are aware, most thyroid cancers are actually slow growing and indolent in nature. Um, it's very few of them that really are aggressive in behavior, and that's about 10 to 15 percent. About one third of patients do um, experience recurrence, however, and 20 percent of those patients um, will actually develop distant metastatic disease. Um, and dedifferentiation is really a concern, and that can occur in up to 30% of patients with recurrent disease. So in the United States, thyroid cancer actually only makes up the 13th most common, uh, most commonly newly diagnosed cancer each year. Um, I work in Mississippi, and it accounts for 270 new cases. <clears throat> so that's the incidence for Mississippi. As you can see on the right panel, <clears throat> the darker orange color um, indicates states that have a greater incidence. And for whatever reason, the state of Pennsylvania actually has the greatest incidence right now. Um, but as you can see, uh, there's probably about 44,000 estimated new cases for this year of 2023. Um, the death rate for thyroid cancer is only 0 0.5. Um, and so you can see that um, while there is a significant uh, number of new cases, the rate of death is actually extremely low. Um, and this slide points that out even further. So I frequently will tell my patients that come in with thyroid cancer that out of all the cancers that you could possibly be diagnosed with, um, thyroid cancer is probably the one that you would want to choose, right? Um, at five years, the survival back um, 2012 to 2018, this data is from the SEER database, um, it was 
Um, so you can see the estimated deaths in 2022 percent of all cancers in the United States, 0.4 percent. Um, so again, um, if you're going to have a cancer, this is probably the one that you would want. What are the risk factors for the development of thyroid cancer? Well, we all know about Chernobyl, um, but exposure to ionizing radiation of two to five gray is a significant risk for the development of thyroid cancer. Usually appears about two to three decades after the initial exposure, um, but 40% of nodules that occur in patients that have had ionizing radiation exposure of this degree um, will actually be malignant. In the United States, however, the greatest risk factor for the development of thyroid cancer is a family history, um, particularly a first degree blood relative. But that relative um, increases the um, index patient risk for thyroid cancer by five to nine fold. Um, as I alluded to at the outset of the presentation, um, the eighth edition of the American Joint Commission on Cancer um, staging, it was updated in 2017. Um, so in the next slide, I have the groupings of the TNM staging. Um, this accounts for not only papillary and follicular thyroid cancer, but this staging system is also used for herthal cell, medullary, and anaplastic, but the grouping as to stage one, two, three, and four varies amongst those. So I'm again discussing differentiated, so papillary and follicular. <clears throat> um, as you can see here in the panel on the left, um, T1 is divided into T1A and T1B disease. Um, so T1A is zero to one centimeters and T1B is one to two centimeters. So if you just think of your TNM staging for most cancers of the head and neck, um, it's less than or equal to two centimeters. So for thyroid cancer, it's divided into T1A and T1B. Um, and then again, T2 is what you would expect it to be, T2, or I'm sorry, two to four centimeters in size. Um, T3 is any tumor that extends um, minimally outside the capsule of the thyroid gland or is greater than four centimeters in diameter. And then T4 is another that's divided into T4A and T4B. So T4A indicates extensive tumor invasion of adjacent structures, <clears throat> but T4B is when it's technically unresectable, wrapped around the carotid um, or extending into the prevertebral fascia. When we talk about nodal disease, um, NX is not, basically has not been assessed um, or measurable. Um, N0 is when there's no evidence of lymph nodes that are involved. And then this nodal staging only ends with N1A versus N1B. Um, N1A is only involving lymph nodes that are near the thyroid. So perithyroidal um, level six lymph nodes. <clears throat> N1B is when they're spread to lateral lymph nodes, retropharyngeal lymph nodes, uh, mediastinal lymph nodes. Um, you'll notice here the staging is now grouped by patients less than 55 years or greater than or equal to 55 years. Um, so you can see that any T, any N nodal status. Um, contributes to stage one and stage two. So the only differentiating factor for someone less than 55 is M1, whether a patient has distant metastatic disease, everything else is equal. There's a slight um, difference in uh, outcomes for patients that have nodal disease, but it's in review of other cases um, prior to the update of the staging system, it was inconsequential for patients less than this age group. Of 55. Uh, when you talk about patients that are greater than or equal to 55 years, um, stage one, as you would expect, includes T1 tumors, but it also includes, includes T2, no nodal disease, obviously no metastatic disease. Um, stage two has um, the T3 designation um, with no nodal disease or any, no, any tumor stage T1 through three with N1 disease. 
And then stage four is divided by the um, really thyroid disease outside the capsule of the thyroid, any nodal station. Stage four B includes um, metastatic disease that's distant. Um, so I'm sorry, T stage three includes T4A minimal extension outside the thyroid gland. Um, the purpose of staging is obviously so that we can give our patients a prognosis um, because everyone wants to know if they're diagnosed with cancer, doc, am I going to be alive to see my child walk down the aisle or whatever the case may be. Um, so the, the AJCC staging is, um, reviewed about every five years and updated um, based on outcomes of prior stratification um, with the hopes of stratifying patients equally in the various stages so that there is um, prognostication that is meaningful, um, not only for patient expectations of their outcome, but also for treatment decision-making. Um, so in review of the SEER, <clears throat> the, the <clears throat> surveillance epidemiology and end results database, um, there are many um, characteristics of a patient's cancer um, that are included in those reviews to update the staging manual. Um, but with respect to papillary thyroid cancer first, since it is the most common, it makes up about 80% of differentiated thyroid cancers. Um, the five-year survival rate for patients that have localized disease is truly near 100%, and that is the same for follicular thyroid cancer. Even if a patient has regional disease for papillary thyroid or follicular thyroid, the five-year survival rate, 99%, again, points to why I would say this is the type of cancer that one would want if they have to have cancer. Um, it drops off for patients that have distant metastatic disease, patients perform slightly better for papillary thyroid cancer if they have distant disease with a five-year survival rate around 76%, and it's 64% for follicular thyroid cancer. And, but again, for all seer stages combined, for papillary, five-year survival is around 100%, and for follicular thyroid cancer, it's around 98%. So how do we arrive at a diagnosis of thyroid cancer? Well, patients typically present to um, their primary doctor who might refer them to an endocrinologist if they have identified a thyroid nodule um, on the annual physical exam. Um, the physical exam encounter um, should involve a detailed history like any uh, medical problem, um, and really focusing on the risk of cancer. So again, um, has this person been exposed to ionizing radiation? In the United States, most likely not. Um, so the greatest risk factor that we're trying to elucidate is family history. And sometimes you can have a, a thyroid cancer that's associated with the syndrome. So the patient might present to you earlier. But at any rate, the family history is important for differentiated thyroid cancers. Um, does the patient have compressive symptoms? Are they having difficulty swallowing, pressure on their throat? Have they had to modify how they sleep? Because when they lie recumbent, they have pressure and can't catch their breath. Um, does the patient or the family member notice any voice changes? Um, does the patient have a breathy voice? Does the patient choke on liquids <clears throat> on a regular basis. Again, if they're coming to you, it's typically because they've noticed a nodule in their neck. Um, but if that's not the reason, sometimes patients have ha undergone workup with imaging for another medical problem, and there's an incidental finding. So you're going to examine the patient to see if you can palpate a mass in the thyroid, whether or not there's lymphadenopathy that's palpable. Um, are the lymph nodes that are identifiable mobile? Um, are there overlying skin changes, et cetera? And then you can have a patient present with uh, thyroid cancer with either hypo or hyperthyroid syndromes. Um, again, if a, more commonly, if a patient has hyperthyroidism, 
there's a 20% um, association with having a differentiated thyroid cancer. And I think that most of you remember if a patient's had a history of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, it burns the thyroid gland out, uh, but those patients also have an increased risk of a differentiated thyroid cancer. Um, oftentimes because a patient has presented to their primary care provider, uh, and a thyroid function test has been obtained. Um, the uh, indication for performing an iodine whole body scan would be if a patient is hyperthyroid. So that goes back to the increased risk of um, differentiated thyroid cancers with hyperthyroidism. And that's an iodine-131 scan. Um, Ultrasound, of course, is the gold standard method of examining the thyroid gland and any associated nodule. It's also uh, really sensitive, um, picking up small um, lymph nodes, particularly um, around the thyroid gland, because your thyroid gland, <clears throat> when you're having a CT scan um, and laying recumbent, might obscure identification of really small lymph nodes. Um, so an ultrasound that's carefully done is really helpful at identifying um, perithyroidal lymph nodes that are concerning. The ultrasound um, is also of extreme utility in performing fine needle aspiration biopsy of a concerning nodule. And this is from the American Thyroid Association uh, recommendations that were last published in 2015. So while this is an update, uh, the guidelines have not been updated in some time. And I can't, I couldn't find online um, when the next expected update is. Um, but if the patient has a suspected thyroid no nodule, TSH is normal or elevated, um, ultrasound again is how you proceed. And there's certain features that I will address in a subsequent slide, um, but these features that um, are documented by the ultrasonographer are totaled by a score and are, dif are differentiated by degree of suspicion. Um, so if a patient has a high suspicion pattern and the node is the nodule is greater than or equal to one centimeter, the recommendation is to go ahead and perform a needle biopsy. Same holds true if the patient's score is an intermediate suspicion pattern. If a patient has a low suspicion pattern and the nodule is 1.5 centimeters or greater, that is also an indication to perform a needle biopsy, but less than that size, um, it's not recommended. Patients with a very low suspicion pattern, a nodule of two centimeters or greater, that would be an indication to perform the needle biopsy. And then if there's a benign pattern, there's no need to biopsy. So you can see the size of the, of the nodule as well as the features on ultrasound are what guide and determine when a needle biopsy is recommended. Um, sometimes patients are anxious um, just by the knowledge that they have a nodule. Um, and so, even though you kind of talk about the discomfort associated with the needle biopsy, the number of passes that are typically performed, sometimes that can help relieve a patient's anxiety just by having the biopsy done and having some interpretation. Um, but these are the um, reasons why the American Thyroid Association has the recommendations that they do. Um, high suspicion is for any solid hypoechoic nodule on ultrasound or a solid hypoechoic nodule with some cystic um, nodule um, characteristics that include concerning features such as microcalcifications. Um, those features are highly suspicious and the estimated risk of malignancy is between 70 and 90%. So that is why those patients should undergo biopsy. Intermediate suspicion, the estimated risk of malignancy is between 10 and 20%. And that again is a hypoechoic solid nodule 
um, but the margins are smooth and there's none of those other concerning features that are mentioned in high suspicion above. Low suspicion carries a risk of five to 10% of having malignancy. And again, microcalcifications, irregularity of the margin are not present um, as well as the shape. So they're not um, taller than the width. Um, very low suspicion. Um, the ultrasonographer, there's a, um, it's not a sponge, but it's a elasticity um, component of the ultrasound. So a spongiform cystic nodule, those are very low suspicion. And of course, um, a purely cystic nodule, um, the risk of malignancy is truly less than 1% and no biopsy is indicated. Um, I borrowed this um, staging uh, grouping for the thyroid imaging reporting and um, data scoring, um, so TIRADS, um, developed by the American College of Radiology. So basically it's the scoring system. Um, this was, the circle is around seven points because it was pertaining to an actual thyroid ultrasound, which I didn't include in this slide so you could see these numbers. Uh, I will tell you guys that this little system right here was on my updated um, boards uh, that I, you have to do after you have been board certified. So at any rate, this is important. Um, it's divided into five different categories. So the composition um, of the nodule, as I said, cystic, low suspicion, solid, hypoechoic, high suspicion. Echogenicity, again, hypo. Uh, hypoechoic um, are when we're concerned. I, I'm not a radiologist. I can't tell you what very hypoechoic is with respect to hypoechoic, but at any rate, they differentiate it here. Um, shape, I alluded to this earlier. Um, nodules that have a taller than wide um, morphology are going to have a greater risk of malignancy. This one's intuitive. If there's a um, smooth margin, lower risk. If there is extra thyroidal extension, breach of the thyroid capsule, that is concerning um, and gets three points. Um, and then echogenic foci, we're talking about microcalcifications. Um, and so <clears throat> depending on the type, macrocalcifications are concerning, but not to the degree of punctite, punctate echogenic foci. Um, so you total all of these scores and then you develop the TIRAD score. And if you have a TIRAD one, it's generally a benign nodule. Tyroid, TIRADs five and greater, um, those patients have a highly suspicious nodule. Um, it should be um, needle biopsy. So again, to emphasize the ultrasound features of concern, Microcalcifications really have the highest specificity for cancer. Um, obviously, irregularity of the margin of the thyroid capsule uh, is another highly specific finding on ultrasound. Um, up to 55% of benign nodules are hypoechoic. So echogenicity is not as specific. Um, intranodular vascularity probably a subject that um, remains controversial, but uh, there are a few studies that report that it didn't have um, independent predictive value for malignancy. So it's not as strong an ultrasound finding. Um, however, follicular thyroid cancer, if you recall how it spreads throughout your body, it's hematogenous in nature. So it might have um, some correlation with malignancy of the follicular variant. Um, and the, another thing that is unique to follicular cancers on ultrasound are that they may be more likely to be isoechoic rather than, or even hyperechoic rather than the hypoechoic of the more common papillary thyroid cancer. Um, and they rarely have distant metastatic lesions for nodules that are less than two centimeters. Um, and so when a needle biopsy is performed, what leads us to next decision-making uh, with respect to evaluation and management of our patients? Well, the Bethesda classification 
um, is used to describe um, what the pathologist is interpreting uh, when they do a uh, prep of the needle aspirate. So non-diagnostic, there's a lot of blood typically, um, or there's just no cells. Uh, so the recommendation would be to repeat the needle biopsy. If there's really concerning features of the um, ultrasound um, examination and or a family history, you might repeat the needle biopsy um, with a <clears throat> genetic test added onto it, um, a benign um, interpretation by the pathologist no further intervention is necessary, um, unless of course the patient um, is, ex is experiencing compressive symptoms um, and desires it to be removed. Um, a lobectomy might be indicated. And then there's of course this nebulous kind of um, diagnosis, atypia of undetermined significance or follicular lesion of undetermined significance. Um, we'll discuss these in a minute. Um, and then um, follicular neoplasm and, <laughs> uh, is another category. And then suspicious without a specific diagnosis of malignancy, which you might get for a patient that has follicular um, disease because to diagnose that, you, it requires evaluation of the capsule to demonstrate um, extra thyroidal spread, which you're not going to obtain on a needle biopsy or you need to be able to demonstrate involvement of a blood vessel, you're obviously not gonna have a cross section of a blood vessel either on a needle biopsy. Um, and then there's frankly malignant. So um, it goes without saying that oftentimes it's difficult to pin down a radiologist, a pathologist for a definitive diagnosis when um, you are uncertain but this Bethesda classification system is extremely helpful to help differentiate who needs additional workup. Um, and again, the Bethesda classification uh, is correlated with those who have an increased risk for um, a thyroid malignancy. Um, so non-diagnostic and unsatisfactory um, if you're really getting uh, into a cystic component of the um, thyroid nodule, um, these might have a 1% to 4% risk of cancer. Benign, 0 to 3%, right? There's sampling error, so you can still have, even though the pathologist has examined the slide and rendered the diagnosis benign, uh, there can still be a foci of cancer that was not um, obtained in the needle bias biopsy. And then there's this, again, kind of nebulous category of atypia of undetermined significance, and that carries a risk of 5 to 15 percent. Um, and then the follicular neoplasm or suspicious um, is 15 to 30 percent, so even greater. And then if the pathologist says suspicion for malignancy, um, greater risk still, and then malignant, of course. I mean, it correlates well with the actual malignancy um, that's identified when the patient's undergone thyroidectomy. So um, the classification is sound. Um, it's just frustrating when you have the indeterminate kind of diagnosis, because it's not a diagnosis. And here we go, non-diagnostic. The FNA should be repeated. Most definitely, because clearly there was an indication for the needle biopsy in the first place, right? We want to make sure we're not missing a cancer that could um, develop the opportunity to de-differentiate. <clears throat> um, so repeated non-diagnostic um, needle biopsy without high suspicion um, still requires close observation, um, a serial ultrasound exam, serial ultrasound exams with the purpose of identifying um, two or more changes in the characteristics of the previous um, ultrasound that are concerning. And that would indicate a need to repeat the needle biopsy. Um, and then if you have gone through this iteration twice and you still have a indeterminate diagnosis, it's probably worthwhile to at least consider 
a thyroid lobectomy to obtain a definitive diagnosis. Um, again, benign, no further um, diagnostic studies are really warranted. Um, ultrasound guided FNA uh, decreases the false negative rate of benign diagnosis. Um, and so the benefit that I'm always telling my patients and getting them to another location in the hospital is that um, truly you want to be able to have the ultrasound performed in the presence of the spinal pathologist, because in real time, the spinal pathologist has the capability to look at the slides, ensure there's enough cellular um, content to arrive at a diagnosis. Um, hopefully. Um, analysis of 12 studies um, by those on this screen um, showed a 3.2% malignancy rate in over 4,000 patients who underwent surgery with benign pathology. So ultrasound guidance is, again, a highly um, useful um, adjunct to the evaluation of patients with thyroid nodules. And how do you follow up patients with benign nodules? Um, again, if they had high suspicion um, features on their ultrasound, you should repeat the ultrasound um, and needle biopsy within the next 12 months. <clears throat> patients with low to intermediate suspicion, uh, repeat the ultrasound again 12 to 24 months after the initial one. Um, and this is what I alluded to earlier. Um, you want to repeat the needle biopsy if there's 20% growth in two dimensions or new concerning sonographic features. Um, that would be highly concerning. Um, a patient that was uh, determined to have very low suspicious features, uh, repeat the ultrasound in 24 months, if at all. I try not to repeat the ultrasound, but again, I also try to factor in um, patient preferences. I think that over time, you can obviously tell which patients are more anxious than others. Um, and, and people just need information to help allay their fears of having cancer. Um, two benign needle biopsies do not require any additional ultrasound. And here we go. The indeterminate um, cytology um, this is where you might consider molecular testing. I think I said previously that if you've done an FNA once and it was indeterminate um, and you're repeating it, you might consider adding on molecular testing with that. Um, but you can counsel the patient, obviously, on the benefits and limitations, and I'll get to that in a second. Uh, but then also, um, you can have a informed discussion with your patient about surveilling them um, or performing a diagnostic lobectomy. And again, uh, this comes into play with patients and their anxiety level. And I think it's also important in this instance to consider family history, right? Because if a family history of thyroid cancer is going to lead to an increased risk and the patients will know that because one, you probably have told them that, but that can make them even more anxious just not having a definitive diagnosis. Um, so that would be something to consider in your um, discussions with your patients. Um, and another thing is you can always consider having an outside cytopathologist review um, the slides. Um, I, at my institution, um, our pathologist is really um, good, and when she says we should consider an outside review, then we should consider an outside review, right? Like I said previously, pathologists, radiologists, if they're not certain, they're not going to call something. So if they're recommending another review, um, then we always take that under advisement and um, inform the patient that that's what we're going to do. And this is just an example of um, an indeterminate follicular neoplasm. Looks normal. <laughs> um, even you can tell that and you're not a pathologist, right? Um, because it looks like normal follicular um, content of an a endocrine um, secreting gland. So um, that is when molecular testing 
um, is probably something to consider. And this is the genetic testing that I keep kind of referencing. Um, so a firma testing, um, again, approximately 10 to 30% of needle aspirates for thyroid nodules are indeterminate. And that's a significant number, right? Um, but surgically, if you were to operate on these people, um, you would find that 70% of them didn't have thyroid cancer. So they've undergone um, an unnecessary risk to their recurrent laryngeal nerve, to their parathyroid glands, and they didn't have cancer. And if they should incur some disease in the future that requires neck surgery, you've created extra scar tissue for someone else to potentially um, increase that risk of injury to a vital structure. So the solution, as Affirma says, um, for patients with an indeterminate diagnosis is to add this genetic um, sequencing um, classifier uh, where you're able to differentiate um, even better than what my slide says. Uh, my slide says negative predictive value of 94%. So the accuracy of the Affirma testing when it's negative for cancer uh, is high. It's actually higher than 94% at 99% um, at, for their latest data. And the sensitivity is also greater than the 90%. So the sensitivity, positive in disease. So 90% of malignant nodules were suspicious by gene expression classifier are actually positive. And it's actually 97% uh, by their latest data. So that is extremely um, helpful, obviously, in guiding your patients through surgery or not. And as we talk about surgery, what is the right surgery to give our patients? Um, so the American Thyroid Guidelines recommend thyroid lobectomy um, in this instance. A total thyroidectomy might be preferred in suspicious lesions um, or in lesions that are larger than four centimeters. Um, that also, the lesions larger than four centimeters is an indication for thyroidectomy for patients that just have a goiter as well. So that um, is no surprise. Um, the patient preference, again, I keep alluding to this, but I think um, patient preference is key um, and probably even more so in this type of cancer than the traditional head and neck mucosal malignancies that I treat. Um, you can really um, partner with your patient in managing thyroid um, disease in this instance. Um, but patients with bilateral nodules, <clears throat> it might be better to perform a total thyroidectomy. You have to weigh risk and benefits. Is the patient obese? Um, is it going to be a really difficult um, surgery to come back if I do a lobectomy and there's a thyroid um, nodule that's 2.5 centimeters? Uh, that's probably a patient that you want to kind of encourage to having a total thyroidectomy. <clears throat> um, obviously, um, if we're talking about a malignancy um, in the thyroid, um, surgery is the mainstay of treatment. Um, there's no radiation um, treatment that is going to eradicate the thyroid um, cancer. So surgery is the um, recommendation. Um, and then there's patients that you might have a but caveat. Um, the rationale for thyroidectomy is to have a means to perform active surveillance um, for patients that have low risk to surgery. Um, and then patients that have a high surgical risk, patients that have other medical um, or surgical issues that need to be addressed, all of these things um, require a multidisciplinary evaluation, um, to undergo a safe general anesthetic, um, as well as uh, if the patient has other morbidities, such as do they have um, vocal cords that are paretic or paralyzed from another, another medical problem, like a neurologic problem, for example? Um, and do they have, uh, you know, do you want to increase that risk for um, bilateral vocal cord paralysis? 
paralysis. A discussion needs to be had about tracheostomy. And for some people, that's just not something that they can wrap their minds around living with. Um, if so, if their cancer is small um, and not life-threatening to their airway, that might be something that you discuss. And they're older, um, different life expectancy. These are all things that you can actually weigh into your treatment decision-making in um, well-differentiated thyroid cancer. But the goals of surgery are to remove the primary tumor, right? Um, and any clinically significant lymph node disease. Um, you can see here, nice small incision to get out the thyroid gland with its nodule in the middle of the isthmus. Um, you want to minimize the recurrence risk. How do you do that? Um, you get out as much of the disease as possible. So the tubercle of Zucker candle needs to be addressed. Um, any pyramidal lobe needs to be addressed. Barry's ligament needs to be addressed. Those are the areas of concern for um, injuring the recurrent nerve. So they need to be addressed aggressively, but they need to be addressed while uh, identifying and protecting the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So those are the areas where there typically will be some residual thyroid tissue uh, when surgery is complete. Um, but the thoroughness of your thyroidectomy also facilitates radioactive iodine, right? The less thyroid cells remaining in the body, the greater the chance of radioactive iodine addressing any cancer um, cells that remain. Um, but again, the stressor is to minimize treatment-related morbidity, not just as it pertains to the recurrent laryngeal nerve, but also your parathyroid glands. Calcium homeostasis is paramount for muscle function. So those are the two key things that we try to um, hone in on when we are operating. Um, so prior to surgery, I mentioned the importance of removing any um, lymph nodes that are concerning for disease. Um, so you're going to evaluate your patient's lymph node status. Again, I said earlier that ultrasound is the gold standard method of identifying um, suspicious lymph nodes in the thyroid um, bed itself. Um, it can detect lymph nodes that are of concern, um, even measuring eight to 10 millimeters. If you recall CT scans, while they're, they're more sensitive in this day and age, still around one centimeter is really the cutoff for trying to um, assess a suspicious lymph node on CT scan. Um, but of course, excuse me, cross-sectional imaging um, is something that's frequently obtained in the community. So we receive a lot of our patients from elsewhere in the state as we're the only academic medical um, institution in our state. Um, but cross-sectional imaging is often very helpful, um, particularly if you're trying to identify if a patient has um, nodal disease that's lateral um, or distant metastatic disease. And um, way back when I was a resident, eons ago, um, the, the teaching was not to obtain imaging um, with iodine contrast because that would delay the radioactive iodine. Um, but it clears in generally four to eight weeks, and most patients are not going to have radioactive iodine in that short order after having surgery anyway. So endocrinologists no longer frown upon that. And Again, in obese patients or any patient that might've had neck surgery in the past, cross-sectional imaging um, is very um, helpful because it gives you the lay of the land of the anatomy. And it's also key for anyone that might have um, disease of nearby structures, such as the esophagus, uh, the prevertebral fascia, the larynx. And the American thyroid surgical recommendations are excuse me, um, for surgery. Again, um, any nodule with a cancer foci that's four centimeters or greater with extra thyroidal extension, um, those patients are going to have surgery with a clinically positive neck um, or disease that has distant mets. In order to address distant mets, you need radioactive iodine. So the patient should undergo a total thyroidectomy, right? Um, patients that have uh, thyroid cancer 
focus of greater than one centimeter, less than four centimeters without extra thyroidal extension, T3, and they're clinically no negative, the initial surgery can be total thyroidectomy or it could be a unilateral lobectomy. Um, again, this is something that you wanna discuss with your patients in great detail because um, um, patients might be anxious about having some residual thyroid in their neck, even if there's no nodule on the pre-treatment ultrasound in the contralateral side. If you're surgically treating a lesion less than one centimeter um, with no extra thyroidal extension, a lobectomy is all the patient needs and nothing else is indicated. Again, total versus HEMI, here are some data to support the um, recommendations that the American Thyroid Association um, made in my previous slide. Um, so in the NCDB database, analysis of over 52,000 people diagnosed with papillary thyroid cancer between 1985 and 1998, sorry for the typo. Um, the 10-year survival rate was essentially equal if they underwent total versus lobectomy, 98% versus 97%, right? Um, similarly, 10-year overall survival, survival in another study of papillary thyroid using the SEER database, over 5,000 patients, they had equal survival. And then there's additional studies using the SEER database to, again, um, really demonstrate that there's no difference between total thyroidectomy versus lobectomy um, for the patients that um, meet the criteria, greater than one, less than four, no extra thyroidal extension on imaging. This is my favorite thing, the lymph nodes. You all recall the lymph node stations? that many of you probably don't deal with on a daily basis. This is so fun to do with residents, I should say. Um, but the main lymph nodal stations that are at risk here are centrally, right? <clears throat> I don't know if you can see my arrow, but in the central neck, this area sits underneath your thyroid gland. You can kind of see the thyroid gland here underneath the omohyoid muscle. Um, but um, these are the lymph nodes that are at greatest risk. And then following that, level three that's adjacent, level four that's adjacent, right? Um, these are the lymph node stations that um, we're gonna want to address. Um, so the central compartment dissection um, for clinically involved nodes, it's recommended by the ATA to address those. Um, a prophylactic central neck compartment dissection should be considered in patients that have advanced primary disease um, or if a patient already has um, nodal disease evident in the lateral neck. Um, because to get here laterally, it has to go through the lymphatics underneath the thyroid gland. Um, and then lateral neck dissection, obviously you're going to do that if a patient has needle biopsy proven um, cervical adenopathy that's lateral. Um, <clears throat> so berry picking. That is very frowned upon. Everyone knows berry picking bad. I, I should say everyone in the ENT world, but lymph node removal is a compartmental dissection, right? Lymph nodes are not just lymph nodes that are isolated. They have vascular connections. Um, and so the lymph nodes draining one station, not just one lymph node in that station is involved. There's potential for the entire group of lymph nodes to have microscopic cancer foci. So that is why the entire compartment is addressed. Uh, I don't need to um, go on about berry picking for that reason, but prophylactic central neck dissections remain debated. Uh, but I think for surgeons that perform them regularly and for surgeons that, um, yeah, perform them regularly, um, and are facile at doing it, it's a helpful thing to do, um, even if the preoperative imaging study does not demonstrate um, central neck disease. And that is because if you return later for a recurrence, it puts the um, recurrent laryngeal nerves at greater risk of injury because you're operating through scar tissue. <clears throat> 
So the central compartment, what does that actually mean? <clears throat> Level six uh, spans the hyoid bone down to the sternal notch, um, laterally to the carotids. So the um, recurrent laryngeal nerves, you're gonna cross um, I liken it to doing the spinal accessory maneuver when you're doing a lateral neck dissection because you're going to go under, bring the lymphatic contents underneath the nerve. Um, so that is why the nerve is at risk. Um, and obviously the nerve travels a different path on the right than it does on the left. Um, and then level seven, this is the fun one, uh, from the sternal notch to the inominate in artery. Um, with good head extension, you can often reach your hand, your finger underneath the sternum and bluntly kind of tease those lymph nodes out either with a Kittner or some kind of blunt dissector. Um, and you can feel the anominate and obviously you're taking great care to have identified um, and protect the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, so level six is the most frequently involved um, lymph nodal station out of all of the lymph nodal stations in the neck. And that's involved about 50 to 65% of the time. Um, it can, it's the most challenging, but it's probably the most rewarding um, for your patient's outcomes. Um, the preoperative ultrasound, um, not everyone has a great ultrasonographer that can perform that exam with the thyroid gland um, in situ. So it's really key for you as the surgeon to kind of review the ultrasound images um, so that you can see that the nodal station was adequately um, examined. Um, and you'll find the ultrasonographer that's really good at it and enjoys it actually. Um, and again, um, when you're counseling your patient, it's imperative to mention the risk of this surgery is risk to the recurrent laryngeal nerve and of course hypoparathyroidism and what does that mean potential tracheostomy um, potentially having to take calcium and vitamin d for an extended length of time um so what are the kind of pros and cons of this central neck dissection since it still remains controversial I don't really think it's controversial in terms of if you are doing it on a regular basis um, it's probably something that you should um, discuss with your patients. But the pros of performing this are, um, again, lymph node metastasis have a negative effect on outcome. As if you can recall the staging that I presented earlier, there's a greater impact on people um, greater than or equal to 55, um, but it still has a negative impact even for people less than 55. So it's important. Um, and it can contribute to disease recurrence. Um, it's beneficial on the effect of the disease course, which is what I just alluded to. And then reoperation again has greater morbidity if a patient should develop recurrence. The cons are the long-term effect on outcomes still remains unclear for patients that have lymph nodal metastasis um, without distant metastatic spread. Um, a study of 590 papillary thyroid cancer patients from Japan didn't find any significant difference in whether um, lymph node recurrence free survival um, was different with a prophylactic neck dissection compared to thyroidectomy alone. So that's where the controversy comes from. Um, but again, it's a discussion about morbidity, potential recurrence with your patient. This is an example of a lateral neck dissection. Um, but lateral neck, again, for a patient with thyroid um, cancer disease, levels three and level four are going to be the most common lateral um, disease stations. Um, but I'll typically do level two as well because it's adjacent to level three. Um, and this one station up on the carotid sheath. Um, I know that this says minimal surgical risk. Um, it's not so much the dissection itself that causes spinal accessory nerve dysfunction. Oftentimes it's the scar tissue um, 
when the patient heals, right? So you have removed all this lymphoareolar content and when everything heals, the skin is sealed down to the underlying um, musculature of the neck and the spinal accessory nerve lies right there. So I think that is where a lot of patients um, dysfunction of their spinal accessory nerve arises. Um, I have found in recent years, paying attention to that more, um, I try to get my patients into um, my speech language pathologist who is certified um, to perform myofascial release to kind of break up the um, fibrosis, whether they've had radiation for a, a mucosal disease. You can see um, and appreciate results and patients report um, that they have greater mobility, for example, it improves dysphagia, for example, um, and it incre increases um, range of motion of their arm, particularly when they couple that with physical therapy or occupational therapy. Um, <clears throat> Kyle leak is something that um, typically you'll identify intraoperatively and can address it if you were unable to um, identify a Kyle leak until postoperatively. Um, if it's low output, um, conservative me measures are typically um, um, fruitful in abating the Kyle leak. Um, sometimes if it's a higher um, output Kyle leak that um, you thought you abated intraoperatively and um, despite following uh, <clears throat> a low um, fatty chain diet, the patient still might develop another Kyle leak and prolonged. Um, those patients become immunocompromised, right? They're losing immunoglobulins. Um, <clears throat> you might consider con consulting interventional radiology to perform embolization of the um, thoracic duct. Um, this is a compilation. It's a meta-analysis of multiple studies that looked at lymph nodal stations involved for differentiated thyroid cancer, um, specifically papillary thyroid. You can see that in the middle of... Uh, no pointer because I'm online. Um, lymph nodal stations three and four. Um, typically, these are the greatest um, nodal stations that are going to have um, disease. And there were only two studies in this meta-analysis that included um, central neck level six. <clears throat> so um, you can see that that by far and away for both studies is the greatest um, likelihood of lymph nodal um, metastasis. But again, levels three and levels four are adjacent to level six. Um, so these should be carefully examined with thyroid ultrasound preoperatively. Um, in general, I think I've alluded to this in this discussion, um, but the central um, neck, if there's clinical disease, it's going to be dissected. If the lateral neck has disease, the central neck along with the lateral neck will be dissected. Um, if the patient has a large primary cancer that doesn't have clinically positive nodal disease, um, I typically will perform a central neck um, especially if there's obvious um, um, disease spread outside the capsule at the primary site, the thyroid gland. Um, and then if a patient has positive lateral disease, um, the general rule for nodal stations is if there's disease in three, then two should also be addressed. So the entire lateral neck um, would be addressed. Um, postoperatively, I think I said this at the way beginning of this presentation, recurrence is not uncommon. Uh, it happens in 10 to 25% of patients. 75% um, it can occur in the neck only. Sometimes it occurs, it reoccurs in the neck and it's not in an obvious place. It might be retroesophageal. It might be uh, just some weird location. Um, so um, retropharyngeal as well. Um, those are things that should be um, identified um, by imaging. Um, and distant disease for distant disease is most commonly in the lung and the bone. Um, and the goals of follow-up are twofold. One, to ensure the patient is adequately suppressed with thyroid hormone. And then two, to detect recurrence. So this is why the relationship of the endocrinologist is key. Um, I try to get our patients in to see the endocrinologist before we even embark on surgery. 
Um, that is a dream in most instances because the wait to get into endocrinology clinic is so long. Um, but at some point, if you're if I'm able to consult endocrinology prior to the thyroidectomy, at least I know the appointment is coming soon after surgery if it's not possible um, for the doctor to see them prior to surgery. Um, and how do we follow up our patients who have undergone treatment of their thyroid cancer? Clinical exam. Clinical exam, as you all know, is difficult to detect <clears throat> Uh, involved lymph node. Um, ultrasound is probably the gold standard. It's definitely the gold standard in Europe. Um, we don't perform ultrasound of ultrasound bed um, typically. Um, if I am suspicious for um, recurrent disease um, after the endocrinologist is following the patient, I will typically order a CT scan actually because the anatomy um, from the CT um, is helpful um, in having an informed discussion with your patient about what surgery will entail. Um, but the thyroglobulin levels are a direct correlate to um, burden of disease. So sometimes you're looking in the neck and the thyroid globulin level is astronomical. So that should clue you in that the patient might have distant disease elsewhere. Um, I'm going to talk about this in a little bit, but for patients that have um, a mutation in their um, kinase pathway, their um, iodine uptake um, might not be as robust as it could be in helping you identify the location of recurrence. And that's where a PET scan might be helpful. Um, genetic testing on whatever specimen has been removed is also helpful um, because it can identify whether or not a patient has such a mutation that might alter their um, iodine um, utilization in their um, organification process. So again, back to the ultrasound. Ultrasound is very helpful because it can detect small lymph nodes as small as two to three millimeters, basically looking for suspicious features, right? Um, the most suspicious feature on ultrasound is um, a short axis of greater than five millimeters um, and then hyperechogenicity um, and cystic component um, in the lymph node. Um, lack of hyperechoic hilum, right, from the vascular core of a lymph node is sensitive, but it's not specific because in a small lymph node, depending on the position of the ultrasound probe, you might not identify the vascular core. Um, so you want to biopsy suspicious nodules. nodules. You can um, have cytology performed to assess the thyroglobulin level within the lymph node. Uh, as well as obviously tell you if this is thyroid cancer or not. Um, and then it's important to know that thyroglobulin is undetectable in more than 20% of patients that are on level thyroxine who have isolated lymph node met metastasis. So again, there's a close relationship between the amount of thyroid disease and the thyroglobulin level. Um, it may be undetectable with isolated metastasis to a lymph node or small lung mets, so in small burden disease. And then it may also be low in recurrent disease for patients that have poorly differentiated thyroid cancer. Um, so basically the differentiated um, cancer has undergone some de-differentiation, rendering thyroglobulin not as useful. Um, <clears throat> for radioactive iodine and other imaging, um, I keep alluding to this, but if the differentiated thyroid cancer has undergone some mutation that makes organification of iodine less robust, then the radioactive iodine might not be as useful in detecting um, recurrence. So that's when a CT scan is helpful. Um, and then I think a PET scan is also useful after you've obtained a CT scan 
that demonstrates findings concerning for recurrence because a PET scan will oftentimes light up um, when there is positive dedifferentiated um, thyroid cancer. What did I want to tell you about this slide? <laughs> um, the risk of recurrence is stratified by the American Thyroid Association into high, intermediate, and low. Um, it's actually something that is mentioned as well in the AJCC um, staging manual. Um, so it's important to have um, this conversation with patients um, who might be at risk for recurrence. Um, and essentially, patients that have follicular thyroid cancer are going to have the greatest risk of recurrence, right? Especially if they had extensive vascular invasion when you perform total thyroidectomy. Um, so high-risk patients are those who have had extra thyroidal extension, not the small microscopic um, extension that's identified simply because you took the thyroid gland out. It was evident on imaging, um, and when you're operating, it's grossly obvious. Um, and you weren't able to remove the entire cancer. Um, intermediate risk, aggressive histology. Um, there could be a follicular variant of the papillary thyroid cancer, for example, that makes it more aggressive. Um, and then there's low risk um, small micrometastatic disease, intrathyroidal disease. Um, one of the things that uh, I imagine most pathology departments um, engage in when they have a thyroid specimen that's um, identified as having a differentiated thyroid cancer, that they've done um, some molecular testing um, for these um, mutations, particularly BRAF, because it can direct um, additional therapies such as ki uh, kinase inhibitors or um, immunotherapy. So um, BRAF and TERT, my hospital actually has to send these out. So um, hopefully these are things that uh, most pathologists are aware of and are somehow obtaining, whether it's in-house or elsewhere. But what do you do if you have a patient that's diagnosed with <clears throat> recurrent disease. Um, oftentimes, um, you can observe uh, more frequently in patients with extensive neck disease or large primary tumors, um, but you may lose the ability to take up the iodine. So again, that's because of dedifferentiation or um, mutation of that um, kinase pathway. But the options for treatment depend on the location of recurrence, right? So, um, and what the prior treatment was, and again, iodine avidity. The iodine avidity is important for radioactive iodine. Um, radioactive iodine, um, prior dose of radioactive iodine is important um, for that consideration. Um, <clears throat> oftentimes for patients that have gross um, extra thyroidal extension at their initial um, surgery, um, or you know that there's... Um, it was an R1 resection, so there's gross disease left behind. Those patients typically have had the recommendation for external beam radiation, and so that becomes a factor for um, treating patients with recurrence. Um, and I think I alluded to molecular therapy. This is where um, next generation sequencing um, becomes important. Um, and surgery. Obviously, the mainstay for treating thyroid cancer is surgical, um, and obviously that depends on whether or not the patient can have a complete extirpation of their um, cancer and have it done safely. So the risks, <clears throat> the benefits have to outweigh the risk for surgery. Um, <clears throat> recurrence that's palpable easily visualized and resectable should be removed. Um, compartment excision is the goal, but it's also not always possible because of prior surgery. Um, I had a patient that I performed neck dissection one through five because the patient had um, gross disease um, at presentation. Um, she recurred uh, underneath the esophagus, so retroesophageal. <clears throat> 
but there are really no other lymph nodes um, lateral to that to remove because they'd already been removed at her initial um, surgery. So surgery for recurrence is a little different than surgery um, at the primary setting because the adjacent nodal station may or may not be at play still, but it should obviously be considered. Um, there's no evidence that treatment when lymph nodes measure less than five millimeters will improve the outcome for the patient. Um, and recommend excision if a lymph node is greater than eight millimeters in the central compartment or greater than one <clears throat> centimeter in the lateral neck. Um, so those are the recommendations for addressing lymph node by station for recurrence. Um, radioactive iodine is often used for recurrent disease, uh, particularly in patients that are poor surgical candidates, um, whose disease is unresectable, it's wrapped around the carotid, it's, uh, you're not going to be able to completely excise it due to location, um, or the patient has distant metastatic disease. Um, external beam is also indicated, I think I've mentioned this um, previously, patients that have gross residual disease um, or who no longer take up um, iodine-131 um, avidly. What are other options that you can do for patients <clears throat> who do not have a surgical option or can't receive any more radioactive iodine? Um, there are studies out there now where pa pa people Providers are performing ultrasound guided radiofrequency ablation. Um, some studies show a mean volume reduction of up to 95%. Um, even other studies show complete disappearance of metastatic foci and up to 60%. Um, another treatment modality um, or palliative modality, I should say, is percutaneous ethanol injection, um, up to 84% of nodes. Um, are successfully ablated in one study at 38 months follow-up. Um, even larger nodes are not as amenable to this treatment. So nodes larger than two centimeters are typically not going to respond to this percutaneous ethanol injection. I apologize for this slide. I'm supposed to remove the box of the um, drug here. But I have mentioned kinase inhibitors a couple of times in the end of this presentation, um, but there are some approved medications for select cases for patients with recurrent disease. Um, <clears throat> one of them is serapinib, the other one is levetinib. How do they work? They work by targeting um, the VEGF pathway um, receptor. Um, and so the side effects are similar for all of the kinase inhibitors. You should know the most common side effect is diarrhea followed by fatigue. Um, and the various different um, kinase inhibitors might have these other um, side effects in a different frequency, but diarrhea by far and away the most common. Some patients might have hypertension, some patients might have damage to the liver. Um, <clears throat> treatment has to be discontinued in up to 20% of patients. Um, patient associated death from kinase inhibitor, um, 1.5 to 2%. So it's not um, insignificant, but it's not a large number of patients either. Um, serafinib and linvatinib, they um, are both um, kinase inhibitors. They work in two ways. Um, one, they help block, obviously, forming new blood vessels that feed tumors. Um, and they also help target proteins that um, normally help the cancer cells grow. Um, so that's how they um, help improve um, patients with recurrence. But you should know there's a whole host of um, kinase inhibitors. Um, of special note are the ones here that are indicated for BRAF mutation. Uh, all of these drug targets my pathologist does not perform. Your pathologist probably does not perform either. But BRAF at my institution and RET are, uh, and TERT are the three that they will reflexively send out. And that's because there are clinical trials that have demonstrated benefit of specific um, targeted therapies 
for those mutations. BRAF by far and away is the most common of those mutations. Um, so these are the two um, targeted therapies for BRAF mutations. Um, venatinib is for the RET mutation. Um, I, there's another one that I can't um, put my finger on right now. Um, Chert's not on here, but that one also has um, some targeted therapy for it. <clears throat> They might provide benefit in metastatic differentiated thyroid cancer. Um, these are just preliminary um, studies, but there's improved progression-free survival um, at five months in trials for serafinib um, and 14.7 months for levatinib. Um, and tumor regression is notable in these studies. But there's no data on quality of life yet. There's no trial that thus far has demonstrated an overall survival advantage for patients on these inhibitors. The American Thyroid Association recommends to consider radioactive iodine for refractory differentiated thyroid cancer that's metastatic, rapidly progressing, symptomatic, or posing an imminent threat to the patient's life. Generally, that would mean airway. Airway, airway, airway. Um, so some of the things that uh, I alluded to this, factors favoring kinase inhibitor therapy, things that might prevent a patient from undergoing such therapy. Um, <clears throat> older patients frequently have cardiac issues. Older patients frequently have clotting issues or some other disease process for which they are on a blood thinner. So these things are probably the two most common things that we experience and discuss in tumor conference that are potential um, prohibitors of having a TKI. Um, final thought here, when I opened this presentation, I said that um, the last time the American Thyroid Association updated their guidelines was back in 2015, right? Um, so in 2019, an inter-societal working group of these groups here, including the American Thyroid Association, the European Association of Nuclear Medicine, and the other two mentioned there, um, they had representatives convened to kind of discuss the um, emerging um, new um, findings and um, treatment considerations for differentiated thyroid cancer, as well as kind of to discuss controversies. Um, I think I've alluded to that during this presentation. Um, one of the things that um, the American Thyroid Association really um, discusses is perioperative risk stratification, but it's not just the ATA. Um, I also mentioned that the AJCC staging has those key factors that um, stratify a patient for high risk, intermediate risk, and low risk for recurrence. And that is what they um, mean with respect to perioperative risk stratification, particularly for recurrent disease. Um, so postoperative thyroglobulin level is really a primary and a secondary risk factor. Um, a papillary thyroid um, cancer is heterogeneous. Um, so again, I said that in our lab, these are reflexive, but they're reflexive send-out labs um, to test for BRAF, RAS, and RET um, mutations because that can dictate additional targeted therapy. So that's one, because there's not enough clinical trial information yet to discuss really overall survival advantages. The second thing that this paper highlights um, is a diagnostic radioactive iodine in the initial staging. Does this radioactive iodine whole body scan have a meaningful and relevant clinical impact? Um, well, it might. Approximately 6% of people um, have a detection of an extra cervical met. So something outside the head and neck might um, appear. Uh, that's a relatively low risk though, right? And thyroglobulin um, post-operatively might um, suggest that something else should be done um, to evaluate for that elevated thyroglobulin level. Um, 
So this is actually controversial um, because not many people have access to um, iodine-124. This is more sensitive um, and gives better imaging um, when you have a functional study like PET iodine. Um, it's costly, um, the half-life is short, and again, most people don't have access to it unless it's on clinical trial. Um, so this is probably something that's gonna play out with respect to functional imaging um, in the future. Um, so that's something to look out for. And then the objective response to radioactive iodine, this is something that's not really quantified. If you think of clinical trials and studying um, tumor burden, um, you think of the RESIST criteria, R-E-C-I-S-T. That's the radiographic evidence of measurable disease. So there's a similar proposal with respect to radioactive iodine, and it's called PERSIS with the functional um, FDG um, PET scan for patients particularly who have dedifferentiated thyroid recurrence um, <clears throat> who might not be as responsive to radioactive iodine anymore. Um, and so that is an important thing that will be um, forthcoming with more information in the future. Um, so to summarize, nodule workup is focused on ultrasound features um, and that guides your needle biopsy. Um, adequate surgery for the extent of disease is important but you should always balance these with the risk associated with your surgical approach. Um, recurrences need to involve the endocrinologist. Typically the endocrinologist is the one alerting you to the patient's recurrence, uh, but you work in concert with these people to best treat and serve our patients. And then newer therapies have some promise, but there's still much to learn um, on the outcomes um, of such novel therapies. I wanted to conclude um, as the diversity chair for the American Head and Neck Society. I think that this advertisement has been circulated amongst you all. We extended the deadline from uh, the end of last month to the end of October. So please, if you have an underrepresented person that might have interest in um, head and neck surgery and cancer research, um, please have them visit the American Head Net Society um, webpage to get more information and please encourage them to apply. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. I like the last slide. There was one quick question.